Hi, y'all. You might have noticed in the news that for like uh, 15 or 20 minutes the U.S. government was shut down or something. I don't know if you caught that. Uh, but I, I hear a rumor that it might happen again sometime in the future for, I don't know, maybe a day. So, this, um, I have seen a lot of disgraceful actions take place in Capitol Hill in my lifetime, from the spectacle of a United States Senator being arrested and dragged into uh, the Senate chambers to do his job, uh, when, you know, trying to, the Republicans in that case were trying to leave the Capitol so there would not be a quorum to vote on uh, legislation they would lose, and they were unwilling to lose with dignity or honor, so they tried to act like children and run away. Arrest warrants were issued for them, and they were rounded up and dragged physically uh, back to do their jobs. I thought that was going to be a low point. I was wrong. <laughs> Turns out that whenever you think you've reached the bottom, there is somebody out there going, Wait a second! <laughs> Hold my beer. I'll take care of this. I have in my time seen uh, the spectacle of United States service members who have been killed in action, you know, combat actions that we sent them to go do. They didn't like you know, recruit themselves, hire themselves, fund themselves to get there. We did that. We sent them there. We gave them the orders. They followed their orders. They died, and they had to be brought home by private charity because of the incompetence in Washington. That was a low point. Uh, so you'd think, but, you know, uh, every day is a brand new day. With a, One of the things about politicians is they tend to be competitive, but I don't think that trying to compete your way to showing how terrible you are is really the kind of thing that you... It's not the kind of legacy you want to leave, I don't think. I wouldn't, but then again, I'm not a politician, which brings me to one of the points. Uh, it seems like it, it is a, if it's not an absolute job requirement, it seems like it virtually is, and that is that you have to be kind of a morally shady person. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that it's possible there exists an honest, upright, outstanding, moral politician out there somewhere. I haven't seen this person, but I'm willing to grant that he or she uh, could exist. But politics is a field where I think that the people who are probably uh, the most mor morally uh, qualified for it, intellectually capable, aren't the kind of people who would survive in it, so we're left with what we get. And it's what we have to work with. But there's a weird thing, and it's process. If you have, if you set in place process recognizing that you're working with a bunch of scoundrels, and you say, well, you know what? We're going to have rules that we'll all agree that if you violate, uh, even if we like it, we're going to punish you. You can still get good behavior when you're in the chamber, even though you won't get it necessarily uh, during the, the campaign season. Well, those political norms in the Congress... Uh, don't hold much force anymore. They don't hold much sway. And there is this quest that's been going on for a while now to see uh, just how terrible you can make things. Now, this, the House of Re Representatives, for those of you who don't know, doesn't have a filibuster, but it used to. They got rid of it once it became so numerous that it was easily the case that all legislation could be stopped because someone could always uh, get up there and do a filibuster. And indeed, that the more people you got, the likelier it was someone was going to be really exercised about something that no one else was exercised about and uh, you'd let them go do it. Uh, so in the Senate, they still retain that, which is fine. Uh, I mean, I don't like the idea that one you know, loud mouth can bring everything to a grinding halt, but uh, with respect to the filibuster, there's at least a certain degree of honor in it. Uh, they have certain rules by which you have to play. And, if, and it is that if this subject is so important to you personally, or to the people you represent, if it's that important, we will let you stop everything uh, but you have to stand on your feet. You don't get to bring any food. You don't get to bring any, you know, a whole bunch of snacks. You have to stand on your feet and you have to talk nonstop. Uh, so for however long you are physically able to remain standing and you know, flapping your gums, we'll let you hold it up. So uh, there you are. Go for it. And you know, uh, I, I, I don't think it's yet happened that a, a senator has spoken until he collapsed. Maybe it has, uh, but they do get tired eventually. They shut up and go away. So there's that. But there's another way that you can do things, like I mentioned the Republicans in the 80s trying to hide around the U.S. Capitol <laughs> to avoid doing their job, to avoid casting a vote they knew they would lose. Now the reason that, uh, well, there are a number of reasons that that happens. There are a couple of ways you can uh, break a quorum, one of which is by just not being there. Uh, shamefully, this has happened in states in the United States and in, uh, at, the, at the federal level, uh, attempts that have been done at this. Uh, in Texas, it's happened a few times recently. Another one is what's called uh, the disappearing quorum or a vanishing quorum, which is where the, the members are physically present. They just refuse to say yay or nay. <laughs> I abstain. I'm not participating. And uh, 
they started playing that kind of game in the house. And uh, the house, which is our, our less deliberative body, so it's weird that it would be much better at, at putting in rules that stop people from behaving badly, because it's the rowdier group, uh, said, no, we're not having this. Uh, if you don't want to say yay or nay, the fact that you are here means you're still a vote, uh, you're still represented with respect to uh, satisfying the quorum. You cannot game the system by refusing to do what you were hired to come do. Part of which is that you are going to lose some of the time and you're going to win some of the times. And you had damn well better learn how to lose with a little bit of grace and a little bit of dignity. <clears throat> uh, not exactly uh, a trait that is, is on great display in the, in the United States uh, capital anytime recently. So, if you look at like uh, the protections that are built into the Constitution, I talked about the ones for the citizens, the ordinary citizens, you know, the rights that citizens have, those are very important. But there are also very important structural protections for members of Congress, for you know, members of the House, members of the Senate. Uh, they, can, they cannot be arrested except for high crimes, misdemeanors, I think treason, uh, to and, going to and from or while sitting in a, a, a session of the Congress. The reason that is there is it's very easy to say, oh, well, you know, he was speeding, we had to lock him up for two days, oh, look, he missed a vote. It is to keep some asshole from preventing a Congress creature going to Congress and doing the job that uh, his, his or her constituents has sent him or her to do. So it's very important that uh, you not be able to interfere with that. You not be able to keep them from going there. They are expected to get there and to debate. Uh, so that's, that applies to the congressmen, applies to the senators, or the senators or congressmen. It, replies, it applies to the representatives and to the senators. A sitting United States president cannot be indicted uh, by a grand jury, can't be brought to a criminal trial uh, until after, assuming he is, until after he is impeached, at which point the, the trial can proceed. And the reason for that is not because Oh, if we have a scoundrel in the office, it'll be great that he can delay justice because you know delay justice delayed is justice denied. So he can deny justice. No, it isn't that. It's just that the 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 executive is it, all the executive powers are posed in one person, one one office that can only be exercised by a person. And you have two options. He can either be running the country or he can be you know listening to pleading motions and testifying and whatnot. You can't have him be doing both. Uh, so they they picked their poison. Uh, things, you know, we will just make this a really strong position. And if you look at the judges, you can't diminish their salary while they are in office. Uh, the only way that you can overrule any other constitutional decisions is by impeachment and removal, which isn't going to happen, or by amending the Constitution, also not likely to happen, or by persuading them to change their minds. So far, that's the only way it has happened. Is you pers well, I'm sorry, the Constitution was amended once in direct response to the Supreme Court. I, sorry, that was the Chisholm uh, case. I almost forgot about it, but yes, I'm aware that it happened. <clears throat> These norms, uh, while inconvenient day to day, serve over the long term. So any short term gain that you get from violating them or finding ways around them, uh, it'll give you your instant victory. You can get that. But think 20 years ahead. What are you leaving to the next generation to contend with? And that's a question that wasn't asked, you know, back when I was a little boy, back, you know, in the set, in this, actually, it's pretty well behaved into this, uh, until the 80s. Uh, not Reagan, by the way, Carter, actually. So this, uh, they talk about the nuclear option. I'm sure you've heard about it. Uh, that uh, this last time it was to get a Supreme Court justice um, on this on the court uh, for uh, Gorsuch, um, and the Republicans would stand up and say something like, uh, "Following the precedent of the Democrats, what the Democrats did with lower court judges, uh, removing the 60 vote requirement and making just a, a simple majority." Yeah, that's following the previous example, which itself followed some previous example, itself followed some previous example. And every time they want to act badly, they use the bad conduct of the other side as the justification for behaving like children, for behaving petulantly. Um, so, you know, the, the thing with Merrick Garland, uh, now, of course, the Senate has, as a matter of raw power, the right not to take up matters. It can simply do that. But if you look at all the protections that are built in for senators, for House of Representative member, for representatives, these are built in to protect them from being dissuaded from doing their job, not to protect them from being basically dilatory. That uh, we will not let people stop you from debating, stop you from negotiating, stop you from doing the things that we send you there to do so we don't have to go do them ourselves. And we pay you very well for it, 170-ish thousand is the minimum salary for a Congress creature. Uh, the, Leadership gets paid differently. Uh, but on top of that 170-ish thousand, I think it's 174, could be more, that they make per year, 
they actually only schedule themselves on, on the calendar 100 work days per year, which is uh, about a third of uh, what a normal person. When you add it all up, they make about six times uh, what it is the ordinary person makes because they give themselves a large income, but then they also make sure they can track the number of days where they actually have to do anything. And uh, the other rest of the time, I guess they're out fundraising, making money, or you know, visiting, I don't know, what, whatever they do. So anyway, if you compare that with federal judges who make more than your ordinary member of Congress, but not nearly as much as they should be paid, they work tons of hours. Uh, they're available all hours of the night, promotions, uh, you know, if there's an emergency that comes up, they have to be there. Uh, most of these people, many of federal judges are worth tens and tens of millions of dollars. They don't care about the salary. Uh, for you, could, most of them are. Well, I don't want to be rude, but you know, we do not. We do not have a young judiciary. But they want to bring in that young blood, and you can't recruit that young blood because these people are coming out of law school with such colossal debt. They have to go clerk for someone to get a good job to pay it off. You know, and you know to get a good salary, so that way they can pay off their their enormous debts. And then by that time, uh, maybe you know, they have they've built a family and they've got they've got uh, things they have to pay for. And so unless they become very rich, they're, they're stuck to being, you know, on the low end of rich. And they, they have enough money where they can afford to maintain that lifestyle, only if they keep working at this level, and they can't give that up, that workload up, to go work in the judiciary because they would go bankrupt. So there's a, a bit of a problem there in recruiting younger, uh, a younger generation to become judges. And that is going to bite us in the ass in the future, but let's talk about what's biting us in the ass now. So each side will do this. Uh, X did Y, and uh, we were really, we pretended we really cared at the moment about it uh, because we were losing. Uh, but now we see that it's actually a good tactic, so we're going to use it. And you get this, this uh, downward spiral in behavior. So this, um, the notion of the government shutting down is a very recent innovation. And as I mentioned, it's Carter's fault. Uh, actually, it's the Democrats' fault, uh, full stop. Now, for those Democrats who might be watching, or uh, liberals who might be watching, I, I, I'm giving shit to both sides, but this is squarely, entirely the fault of the Democratic Party. For 200 years, no one had ever thought that if there was a funding lapse, it meant that people had to be furloughed, until Jimmy Carter came along, and he had his attorney general, because uh, he wanted to fight with the Congress, both houses of which were controlled by the Democrats, uh, and he decided to drop the hammer on his own party to win. So he won. And the way that you know there's not a, an ounce of intellectual heft to the position is that the moment the government was reopened, the Attorney General revised his earlier opinion that would allow for the not furloughing of certain people. It is either a principle that it is invalid to expend the funds, full stop, or it is valid to expend the funds, full stop. You can't have it, well, it's, it's valid if they're trivial people, but not valid if they're very important people. There aren't two sets of rules. There's one rule book, and it's if you're going to say that the Constitution does not allow the, the accumulation of debt that has not been funded already, then it must be true everywhere. But it isn't true everywhere, because there's no intellectual heft behind what, the, what Carter had his attorney general do. It was simply to win, to, set, to, to, to show strength, which is weird for Carter to have tried. Apparently, the only place he's willing to flex his muscles on his own party in the country. Other people around the world can do whatever, and, and he'll just call them, when they take Americans as hostages, he says, well, they're being intransigent. Well, you know, that says about the least of it. So anyway, uh, and then for the first time in the United States, it only lasted for a few hours, but the first time, uh, there was a government shutdown. And then three immediately followed during the Reagan years, and he had a couple during Bush, Maybe one during Bush. You had two or three during Clinton and his whole term. Um, then you had one during Obama, one or two during Obama. Now we're for two years into Trump. We've already had three. This is not a problem that has gotten better. It is getting worse. We've just had the longest shutdown, and one of the reasons for it is, is it is a general trend of the Congress over the last few decades, where they have certain constitutional authorities that they don't want. And they don't have certain constitutional powers that they do want. They want to control the executive. They don't want to legislate. So what they do is they, uh, they delegate legislative power because reasons. Uh, it frees up their time so they only have to work 100 days a year. And they will say, uh, we are going to write a bill that, that does X. And after the, bill is, after the president signs the bill, 
an administrative agency of the federal government, of the executive, will fill in the X. And whatever X is put in there, uh, that will be what the law is. And we'll just establish that there's a penalty for doing, for not uh, following the, re the regulation for X. And so, uh, you know, that can visit uh, criminal or civil penalties on people. When I talk, um, if you watch the Gorsuch hearings, most people probably didn't, uh, he made it a point that um, there are several thousand criminal statutes in the, in the federal system. And so many uh, federal regulations, the things that fill in the X that are put into the statute, so an X might, when it says, you know, and uh, the, 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 whatever, regula uh, whatever agency will fill in X, they might write 500 regulations to fill in X. Those are 500 laws. They have the force of law, the violation of the provisions, uh, which you can't actually read, uh, can subject you to penalties. And when I say you can't actually read them, I mean that there are now so many you would spend your whole life and probably not be able to exhaust the number of pages of regulations that are in the Federal Register. It is that expansive. It takes up many, many, many volumes. Many, probably a shelf mile. I have no idea. But uh, people have looked at this and there are, they can, they can uh, confirm that there are 300, 400, 500,000 of them. There are so many they, don't, they can't even count them individually anymore. So Congress having done taken up that little trick of saying, well, instead of our actually sitting here and writing a law and then when it work, doesn't work, you know, us using our powers to fix it, we're going to say, no, we'll create an agency that works in the executive whose function it is to do this. And we've absolved ourselves of the problem. And then the Supreme Court comes along and says, well, why shouldn't they have the power to do that? Because it's called legislation. Maybe they should have the power not to legislate. Maybe that should be put somewhere else. But it isn't at the moment. Read the Constitution. So the, the Supreme Court for years thought its job was to basically carry Congress's water, carry the executive's water, instead of saying, no, stop, you can't do that, go do it right. They would say, well, you know, we'll, we'll contrive all these ways of, uh, in an attempt to be minimalists, of saying, yes, well, it wouldn't be proper for us to strike this down, so we'll just rewrite it. You know, they're not a revising chamber. They're not the House of Lords, which, by the way, I've watched oh, all the debates uh, this month um, on the no-confidence vote, uh, Brexit, I've watched all that uh, on, on Parliament TV. I've watched all of the debates and that they had here on the government shutdown. You know, I'd said last month that I politics has gotten kind of boring. Boy, if only I'd waited a few days, it would have gotten interesting again. So anyway, um, that's, I don't know, dozens of hours this month I've spent listening to parliamentarians and legislators flap their gums. And boy, can those people get wordy. I should be one of them. <clears throat> Anywho, so... Uh, the Supreme Court, I guess, thought for a while that it was a revising chamber, and its job was to back up uh, what the, the mistakes that other people had made. And now, because of stare decisis, when you finally got when you finally got new justices on the court who actually believed in stare decisis, were stuck with this bad nonsense because they're like, well, you know, it's been done, it's a mistake, yes, but the, you know, we don't we need to have some really important reason to overturn it. How about it's ruining the fucking republic? How about that? Is that enough? So anyway. <clears throat> This uh, this pattern in Congress, this trend in Congress, is that they want more and more power. They definitely want to make sure they draw their salaries, their full salaries, no matter what, uh, while giving away as much of their responsibility as the Supreme Court will let them give away. At the same time, wanting to, under the, the guise of oversight, uh, have the executive constantly reporting to Congress and then taking direction from Congress rather than the President. That's why they create independent agencies, not to have them take orders from Congress, but to do Congress's will because they'll free it from the pre they'll free the agency from the President. This is a it is a multi uh, side attack on the constitutional divisions of powers and the constitutional processes that are so important that for two hundred years uh, worked very well. When you go back and you look at all the the, the dirty tricks in, in the past, what you'll see is the filibuster was like the controversial bit, and when people tried to to use the so-called nuclear option or these other uh, kinds of these other salami tactics, those people were punished for it, because there's a difference between standing up and fighting and saying I want a system that lets me get all of what I want for no cost, for none of the pain. So that's why I didn't have any time for. The, the lectures on morality from the Democrats or the Republicans or who, whatever idiot this week is standing up and saying, uh, it's terrible the government shut down. Think of the workers. Yeah, you, you... Congress cares so little about these workers that they fight tooth and nail 
against ever having their own pay cut into. There are a few honorable members who will actually uh, forfeit their salary. But the point is that they're entitled to it in the first place. Uh, if the proposition is that this, is, this issue is so important that it's worth bringing the entire government to a halt, that this is an existential threat, that if it's not resolved now, if it's not this important, to, it's this important that it must be solved now, uh, then it should be sufficiently important that it stops everything. If it is really that important, we should, we should re-divert all of our attention to that issue. But that is not what these things are being used for. It's, it's for a wall the Democrats have voted for in the past, or a barrier, or a whatever. Call it an iron curtain, call it a wall, the, the, you know, a quarter of the great square of America, whatever you want to call it, I don't care. Every uh, Democrat in the Senate has voted for this before. Who wasn't uh, Well, actually, everyone in there, since uh, all the ones who are in there now were in there last time, even though there are a couple less in there now than there were last time. Uh, they've all voted for this mileage. The difference is like uh, it's like 50 miles. That uh, there's a difference between what Trump is asking for and what they've approved in the past. I don't think 50 miles of wall or barrier or what fence, whatever the hell you want to call it, is worth uh, that kind of reaction. But this is part of the outrage culture that instead of electing responsible people, the people we've elected who essentially are responsible are be beginning to act like they're having a Twitter war. We'll just we'll just do this. We'll just do that. And then Nancy Pelosi. Uh, says, we're, actually, we won't even negotiate. This is where I have the problem. This is the reason that all these protections were put in there. You can't diminish their salary while they're in service for the, the court. can't indict the, the president. If you want to do that, you must, you must uh, create a constitutional crisis, impeach and convict him. Uh, and that you cannot interfere with the Congress creature's ability to get to Congress and to negotiate. That all these protections are built in to make sure that these people will show up and will do their job. They will be able to show up to do their job without penalty. Nancy Pelosi wants to show up and not do her job just to win. Now, Trump got up and walked out of a meeting, which that is a that is a negotiation tactic. But the people who get up and walk out of a meeting have to come back. Uh, you know, when it's this kind of system, like what we have, this isn't another nation. This is within our own system. The people get mad. They will. The meetings will break up. They go away. They have some coffee, maybe a drink, whatever. And they pick it up the next day. Everybody understands that. But Pelosi just says, no, actually, uh, we're not going to negotiate at all. In other words, I want to draw my full salary, which doesn't mean anything to her since she's worth $100 million. Uh, and I want to do absolutely no work. And in fact, in addition to doing absolutely no legislative work, I want uh, to spend tax dollars to get on the plane and, and leave the Capitol, the only place at which I have any authority at all. Um... I'm glad that Trump said, no, you can't use our plane. Of course, you can fly commercial if you'd like. But uh, what I think should happen is that uh, the last time we amended the Constitution to deal with Congress creatures, or uh, among the last times, uh, one, of, one of the things that we did was say, you can't, vote your own, you can't vote yourself a salary increase that will take effect during the life of the same Congress. You have to wait until there's been a, an election in the House of Representatives to have intervened. And then the pay raise can go into effect. Because uh, after centuries, we started to notice that, you know, they seem to be really good at regularly giving themselves pay raises while also regularly reducing the amount of time they actually have to work. Uh, we should stop this. If the, if the issue is such that, just like with the filibuster, if you think it's that important, uh, spare, save up your energy, munch, 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 drink all you can, get a catheter maybe, because once you go in there and you start talking, uh, you can, you can talk uninterrupted for as long as you're physically capable of staying on your feet. You don't get to rest. You don't get any snacks. Uh, you just stand there and keep talking and talking and talking until you collapse or you say, oh, fuck it, I quit. Uh, and then you go away and we do the vote. If it's really that important, then uh, you should have to have some teeth and uh, some skin in the game. You should have to take your share of the pain, which Nancy Pelosi and the other Congress creatures in the House don't want to do, and many in the Senate don't want to do it. They want to just play the game to win, which is fine. Uh, I, I, I'm all fine for people playing to win, uh, but you, you simply, if you're going to use salami tactics, it, you should have to pay a price for it. And the price for it is this, that uh, the moment the government is shut down, and this hurts the president as much as, as it will hurt the, uh, the Congress, even though the president is a billionaire, I have a solution around that. All of their assets for all the members of Congress and the President are frozen. All of their personal assets are frozen, or their cars are taken away. They have no access to it. Uh, they are given the average amount of money that uh, 
you know, the, the, the studies are done every year about how long the average household can go. Uh, the kind of uh, unexpected expense it can incur without going you know, under. And it's about $800. So they're given that $800, and then they're given one penny less than the minimum wage for every hour. They, in fact, are in the Capitol building and working, not eating, not sitting around talking, having negotiations, having meetings. And that if any, and they can, they can avail themselves of any uh, sale item that would be general, uh, available to the general public, like, you know, you some place like Denny's will say 10% off for military veterans or military members, veterans, blah, blah, blah. They can, and since they're all old, I guess they can do the senior citizen menu. They can take advantage of any sale for food items or whatever, coupons that are, that are just out there already, but, but no special accommodation. Oh, also, they're, all their staff, uh, everyone's staff is sent away. There are no more personal assistants. Their chefs are gone. The parliamentarians are gone. The only thing that remains in the, in, in the House, I'm sorry, in the Senate, oh, shit, in the Congress, is a small committee of civil servants who disperse the funds that these uh, representatives must live off of. Uh, so yes, if it's really worth it, they can take the inconvenience, but if it goes on long enough, their families are going to start losing their homes, just like the people uh, you know they're screwing over. And uh, because I'm such a big believer in uh, consequence for bad acts, particularly at this kind of level, that it should be punishable uh, in violations of this. So if they, if they get a dollar from someone that they shouldn't get, in other words, they must exclusively rely on that $800 plus the one penny less than minimum wage they make per hour. If they dip into any of their personal assets, their wife you know, smuggles them a fiver, that both the wife or the husband and the member of uh, the Congress creature will be subject in the discretion of the jury, unreviewable by a judge. This, the, the penalty will be unreviewable by a judge. They shall be liable to any sentence the jury shall impose up to and including death. I'm really serious about it. If you think that it's that important, put, some, put, your, uh, put your neck on the line, put some skin in the game. Don't just sit around and say, oh, well, this is affecting other people who I pretend to care about. Where's my private chef? Which they do have for cabinet secretaries. Uh, general officers get private chefs. Members of Congress, I, I have no idea what, what perks they get, but I'm sure they're pretty good. Uh, I assure you, they, didn't, they did not just vote themselves a you know, salary three times greater than the median salary while reducing their hours to a third of what you work and stop there. There's more, I'm sure. Uh, they have these large staffs. Get rid of all of it and put them on a very small budget. So, you know, I hope you like some ramen noodles there, Nancy Pelosi or whoever else, uh, because that's all that you will live off of. And if you, to pay any debt, to cover any problem your child has, uh, I don't care if you're, if you're a Congress creature and your, your kid gets run over and you have to come up with more money than you have to cover the deductible. Tough shit. Live, by the same, uh, live under the same conditions you so happily impose on other people. And I don't want to hear this nonsense of both sides do it too. Yes, it takes two sides to be this fucking retarded. And I'm talking about punishing both sides for behaving this retarded. If the issue really is the kind of existential crisis that is so important to have, to have it be resolved at all costs, then we would already be resolving it at all costs. Uh, there wouldn't be conflict over that. The, the things that require that kind of uh, reaction are obvious. It's like when the World Trade Towers collapse or Pearl Harbor goes up in flames. It's very, very, very obvious. Which is why, if you watch the debates from after Pearl Harbor, uh, people who were not interventionists, they were the isolationists, one of them uh, in the House stood up and says, and at an appropriate time, uh, I, I've been arguing against this, I think war is wrong, blah, 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 but for the same reasons in the First World War, I did this, I will now do it, I will be leaving my place here and joining the military to go fight the war, because it's not optional. It's obvious when that happens. You don't need to shut the government down. These kinds of things that are done are, are luxuries, for the elites in Washington. They have nothing to do with you. You are just a pawn in their game, and they are not issues of that import. But because there's no price to be paid for behaving badly, they will continue to behave badly. That's why we should amend the Constitution uh, to stop it immediately. Have a good day.